So we're going to continue the, the review uh, from dynamic memory allocation. How far did I go with dynamic memory? Did we talk about the... Oh. <laughs> okay, we'll talk, about, <laughs> we'll talk about that. Sure, no problem. Um, um, so half duplication, full duplication. You already know. I don't need to mention it because um, half duplication communication is... <laughs> what are you talking about? Usually I say that at the beginning of the semester, half duplex and full duplex communication. Half duplex communication is the one that it's like the radio, listen to radio. So the, the, the person who talks at the radio hopes that you're listening, but there's no way for them to know that you're doing. Full duplex is walkie-talkie. When you talk, they respond. When you talk, you respond. That's how I teach in class. <laughs> That's what it is. So, which means I want response from you guys. It's not like just sit and go with there listening. You have to participate. Okay, so we talked about dynamic memory allocation, and that, that's where I'm going to uh, pick up from the last time. Uh, going through um, uh, quickly, uh, um, uh, kind of cover what we, we said and, and continue after that. We said that statically, statically allocated uh, uh, memory is the memory that uh, you uh, create while you write the code, and the compiler actually puts that piece of uh, memory inside your executable, and therefore we're pre when your program runs, your executable goes into memory, uh, and with it, all the memory that you ask for, like this integer if I will go into memory, program runs, everything's beautiful, you use the array, program finishes, operating system takes the executable out of the memory, and therefore your memory with it, the array and everything, will be managed and everything's good. We said in dynamic memory allocation, and I, I mentioned it's not static memory, it's statically allocated, two different stories. So if somebody says static memory, that's a completely different ballgame, okay? Hopefully three, four, five, we'll talk about that, or maybe a little over here when we have time. But uh, statically allocated memory is uh, what you see over here. And we said in dynamic memory allocation that the story is different. Instead of actually having the whole thing created and put in the executable, what you do is that you um, um, only uh, create the pointers and you wait for the program to run to assess and see how much memory you want. And after that, you allocate the memory while the program is running. And so at the moment that the, the memory is getting allocated, no compiler is there, no uh, code is there, nothing. You, don't, you are not there. It's your program that decides how big is the memory that it needs. Well, and you know that. You ask the user, you see if the memory is getting... You have different ways of assessing to see uh, how much memory you are taking. And that memory is actually allocated inside the heap, which is a shared memory between all uh, applications running on your computer. The only problem with dynamic memory allocation is that the good thing about dynamic memory allocation is that your executable is small. The program decides how much memory it needs. You don't need to uh, have lots of memory carried around in your executable. You, you can decide exactly how big or how small your memory needs to be. And problem with it is that you are responsible to give that memory back to the operating system. If you don't do that, the operating system has no way to know that that memory is not return and therefore it will be wasted until you reboot your computer. We call that a memory leak. We talked about uh, uh, memory allocation and uh, 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 the kind of pros and cons and things that you need to follow. We said that uh, memory allocation, dynamic memory allocation is a very powerful thing. But because it's powerful, you can hurt yourself with it very easily. Therefore, you have to make sure that you follow specific type of rules and guidelines that are not uh, uh, enforced by the compiler. Uh, you have to enforce it with your own obsessive behavior in dynamic memory allocation, which are these. Number one, when you create a pointer, you are not using that pointer until dynamic memory allocation actually takes place. You don't think that if you just, some of the things that I mentioned is obvious, but I need to mention it anyway. So when you create a pointer, you cannot just use it. You cannot just see what is the target and start using it. It's not going to work that way. When you actually uh, uh, create a pointer, that pointer has a number in it, okay? So um, um, 
what is the ad, like what, what is an address? When we say address, when we say address, what do we mean? A place where something is stored. The, uh, isn't that the memory? A place that something's stored. A place that something is stored is, is the memory, right? But what is an address? The person who knows all the answers. Is, says, right. <laughs> yeah, an address is represented as an hexadecimal value, but it is so all integers. Hexadecimal value, so I cannot put it as decimal? You can. So hexadecimal is just a presentation yeah. of the type. So what is the type of an address? Actually, so what is the type of an address? Um, type of an address. Okay, how many different types? Like category of language, go back to IPC 144. When we are looking at the language C, C++ language, when they say types in language, we have two major categories of types. You divide the types in two major categories. You know what those two are? Primitive types? Nope, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's C++. I'm talking C. When you're looking at any type of variable, the type of the variable is separated in two major categories that are IPC one four four numerical or character I don't know right. yeah you do you do know if I if I tell you say ah so uh, I, I don't know either seriously great uh, I was thinking we have two types of number only two types of number in C language okay. integer and floating point. When I say variable, variable means number. Okay? So we have two. So you knew it, right? Thank you. So, so, no, I didn't say, I didn't, yeah. So I said we have two types of number. We have top, uh, floating point and we have uh, whole numbers. Okay? Integral numbers. Correct? Right. Okay. Now, having said that, what is a type of an address? Um, hello? <laughs> 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 an unsigned integer. An unsigned integer. So it's an unsigned integer. So a type is an unsigned integer, which is an integral, correct? So we should not give addresses extra credit. They are just numbers. When we say num when we say address, it's just a number. When we say pointer, it's just an integer type. We have two major types: floating point and integrals, right? Integral, so an address, when you are saying it's an integral variable, it holds an integer number, which happens to be unsigned. Did we say it? We said that last time, right? Okay. So, all right. So, because it's three times I'm, I'm, I'm saying it, I don't know if I said it in this class or not. That's why I, feel I sound like a broken record. But good, it's a review for you. Because it's an integer value, we don't need to, well, we, we don't need to give it extra credit. It's just an integer value. And because of that, when we create a variable, that variable, might have some garbage value in it. That garbage value is a positive number because pointer is a positive number. And that positive number is address hap could be address of some byte in memory. And if we use it without setting it, we crash the computer or crash the program or something. So I cannot use it. Next is uh, uh, the correct way, correct status of a non unused pointer we said is a null pointer. So whenever a pointer is not used, you set it to null, which means you can identify that this pointer is not used. If you follow this rule always, if you always set a pointer to null when you are not using it, then later in the program, you can check the value of a pointer to see if it's null or not, to see if it has memory or not. Okay? And we continue like that. But if a pointer is null, obviously you cannot access its target because it doesn't have any address and therefore it's going to cause a null assignment. Uh, null pointer assignment exception, which is an error. Okay? Uh, going out of range, and, and it is not setting like that Valgrind thingy that you see sometimes give you, you see there is no memory leak, but Valgrind gives you some silly error in your application. That's usually when you don't have, an, when you have an uninitialized pointer accessed. And when you have uninitialized pointer access, by chance, the value have been zero. So uh, it didn't do anything with it. But Valgrind tells you that, hey, what you're doing is wrong. If you take it to another platform, it's going to crash. So that's one of the common things that you have in Valgrind. And that's one of, one of the students in this class asked that that's a problem. And he is not 
here now. Okay. By the way, I'm gonna th I think I'm going to start taking attendance um, to see who's coming to class. All right. So. Huh? <laughs> anyway, so. Always stay within the range of your. Always stay within the range of your. Uh, range of your. Uh, uh, me the memory that you have allocated always stay within the range. If you go one further, uh, it may fail and have a uh, 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 crash, but if it doesn't, then that's a very bad type of error because it usually happens long after you have written the program. So uh, because of this dynamic memory allocation, dynamic memory problems are usually the most notorious type of bugs that you have in your application. Always make sure that before you reassign a, a pointer to a value, you, that you have deleted the memory. You freed the memory and gave it back to the, to the system. If you don't do that, then you're going to have memory leak, which is like that. Uh, correct state of an unused pointer for dynamic memory allocation is always null, and you have to keep track of the size of the, of the memory somehow when you are writing your program. Make sure when you actually uh, allocate the memory, the size is always updated with the, with the thing that you have. So when you resize, everything's going to be good. And when you delete and everything is gone, you make sure you set the size back to, to zero so you know everything is gone. Not deleting with the same syntax that you have allocated will cause either memory leak or crash, which means if you create allocate an array, you have to delete like an array with square brackets. If you do not allocate you like an array and you uh, allocate a single entity, then you cannot delete with square bracket because that's going to crash. If you only if you delete uh, an array without square bracket, only the first element is deleted, and therefore it is going to uh, cause a memory leak. Yes. Oh, you will, because, because we are doing primitive values. So it was actually a very good question. Uh, the question was that when we are doing dynamic memory allocation, usually we are allocating 900 things, right? And then we use it. When do you allocate only one? If you are having an integer and you want to allocate, that doesn't make sense, right? But sometimes an object is humongous, one object. You have an object that inside it has arrays of many things, right? And that object may be needed in your application or not, correct? So let's say you have, let's say I have an object, that object is called Seneca College. Inside Seneca College, I have an array of classes. Inside array of classes, I have arrays of students. Inside each student, I have name, yada, yada, yada. So one object of Seneca College will consume humongous amount of memory, right? Now, when I'm running the program, I don't know if I'm going to use this object or not. And it's a single object. That's when I do dynamic. I allocate if I need it, but it's only a single thing. Again, it all depends what is the size. Yes? Are we going to review references? Because I feel like that's kind of a newer concept. If you want to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. References? Sure, 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 sure. Well, they're very actually simple. Extremely simple thing to do. OK, so I'll come to that soon, OK? So um, when uh, reusing pointers, always make sure they're actually not being used, which means uh, if you actually want to do dynamic memory allocation, check to see if the data is not null, if you need to do something with the memory. So check it, and then free it. Freeing a memory doesn't need to be checked to see if it's null or not, because it automatically does it. Can you see from there? Are you good? All right. <laughs> You're sitting in that corner. So, all right. So, yeah. So, yeah. So, to make sure that you do all your unfinished stuff, then free the memory, then uh, do dynamic. If you don't have anything to do with the data, you can freely call the delete. Delete ignores deletion if the pointer is null. Okay? Yes. 
Okay, so, and then reuse the size, update the size at all times, stay within the limit of your memory allocation, and you are just fine. Now, how do we resize memory? Did we talk about memory resizing? I don't think so. Yeah, yeah, but I will, but I will talk about it. Before doing that, before saying anything on that one, I'm just going to talk about references very quickly. One basic thing about references, what they are and how they act and work. First of all, references behind the scene, they are implemented using pointers. Okay? But do we need to know that? No. <laughs> so from our perspective, references of some, are something new. Okay? A reference is literally an alias, and there is nothing else on it. My name is Fardad, call me Freddy. Nickname, okay? It's an alias, which means when I actually do some, uh, when, when you create a new reference, you need an already existing thing. It's not like a pointer. A pointer can be empty, not pointing anywhere. But a reference cannot exist without something already being there. That's the difference. Number two, when you create a reference, how does a reference help us? Why it is more convenient to use it? We have to understand how the functions are called. Did I mention how, not IPC, but did I mention over here in this class how the functions are called in C language? No. Okay, how the functions are called? If I have a function, void foo integer a, and in here, I do something with A. I don't care what, OK? And now, in my main, I'm going to call that function. How does a function get called? How does it pass the values through the argument list to the argument? How? This is how it is done. When I have a function, let's say over here, I have integer x, whatever. And in here, I say foo x. Then, what happens over here, how does it actually pass it, is as follows. Behind the scene, when a function is called, the function is called like this. This is how the function is called. And that's why the arguments are actually variables inside foo. They get created when foo is called. They get destroyed when foo is gone. So an argument inside a function is like a variable inside the function. The only difference is that those arguments are initialized by the values passed. Do we understand that? Because of this fact, Unlike regular references that you cannot create by themselves, I cannot say integer reference r. That's illegal because r must take reference of an already existing thing, correct? Unlike that, in a function, you can create an argument of type reference because it's not created. It will get created when the function is called, and it will be initialized by the argument. Therefore, if I have something like this over here, it is completely correct to write something like that. Because when I call, uh, yeah, 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 that's a conflict. Um, I'm going to call this one fa. OK? So when I actually call that, if I say over here fa, and I say x, the result would be, why did it jump up there? I have no idea. Fa integer reference r set to x. The difference would be, in this function call, r will be an alias for x, which means anything you do in r in fa will affect x outside of its scope. That's how it happens. That's how references are amazing. Not only that, I can do some crazy stuff with it. For example, look at this. I can say, for example, double reference crazy double reference val. And in here, I'm saying return val. So what am I doing in this thing? In this function, I'm receiving an alias and returning it. 
What is the type of the function? An alias, which means crazy by itself is a reference, is a new name for something, correct? So this is what I can do. Let me actually make this an executable. I can actually do this for x. Now I can say equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. No, sorry, crazy, not for. Oh, it's a double. What are you doing for that? Double d is 1, 2, 3, 4, 4, 5, point like that. And in here, I'm going to pass d. And this one is going to be 543.21. And I'm going to go c out d. OK, take the spaces out. OK, so what happens over here, I have a function at left side of an assignment operator. How can a function be a left value? Impossible. But what happens over here is that crazy gets the D, right? And passes D to val. So val becomes new name for D, correct? Then it returns that val, so crazy becomes new name for val. But val was new name for D, therefore crazy becomes new name for D. Therefore, this will change the value of D. Got it? Do I make sense or I'm absolutely bananas? Okay, let me just, let me just run it and you'll see. So, so when I come over here right now, Give me two seconds. OK, so in, in here, what's going on here? Oh, OK, so sorry. OK, so we are on main. And now, are we good? Yes. No. Oh, yeah, making a ta, 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 ta. Making a no, no, we'll come to that too soon. No, it won't. It returns. If I remove that reference, you've got to get an error from compiler. You know what does that mean if you do that? Can I do this? Can I write something like this? No, no. Can you do that? No. If I remove the reference, it means that. Got it? Does that make sense? So that crazy reference make the crazy a reference for D. Does that make sense now? All right, good. So, so now if I run the program, you'll see that like X over here is actually now 10. And R is a reference, and D is 1, 2, 3, yada, yada. Obviously, this is going to print 10. That's going to do something. It's going to print 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. But this crazy thing, it goes up in here. Now, val over here is 1, 1 2, 3.45. When it's returned, it comes over here and says, now, crazy will be equal to 5, 3 point, which is essentially D. And it happens, and D becomes 5, yada, yada, yada. Are we good? OK? And that's reference, my friend. All right. All right. At line 18? Yeah. I'm nothing special. I just created a new name for X for absolutely no reason. <laughs> so that, I just wanted to show you the syntax. That's why I did it. 
because I wrote R only, let me just do it like this. So essentially, this is going to be like this. I'm going to say, so let me stop this. How do I stop it? Uh, no, one of these will stop it. There you go. Okay, so. So this is actually what I wanted to do. I'm going to do it like this, and I'm going to comment it, say, syntax error, syntax error, right? You can't do that. Are we good? OK. All right. So save it. So that, that I'm going to call it references. So I'm going to call it a reference.cpp, just for you to know. And you see this crazy reference? It's going to come out handy, oh mama. You're going to use that for so many different things that makes things I think you are using it for your text and your line in workshop six, aren't you? So you actually returned the reference of something? So the object became represented? So, yeah. Anyways. All right. So good and good and good. So now we can we go with resizing and see how resizing is done quickly? OK. Um, I'm, I'm not writing codes on this because Quite frankly, we have a lot to do, and if I want to code, it takes time. So I'm just going to show you what it is. Get these slides. Obviously, it's going to be in your notes. Uh, use these slides and want as like a one, two, three steps to do resizing, and you're never going to have any trouble. Okay? So resizing memory. So at any moment when you are resizing memory, these are the steps you need to take. Obviously, you have, and as you see, this is M data and M size which means usually you are doing all these things inside a class. Of course, because C++ is a non-object-oriented language, it can do non-object-oriented stuff. You can just do this with regular variables in a function for some unknown reason. But usually these things happen inside the class. That's why I'm writing it this way, OK, with M underline. All right? So it means I'm in a class. The class has some data. That data has size of 7. These could be anything. Are we good? All right, so what we do over here, we have the data. It has a size. We are not satisfied with that. Either we want to shrink it, make it smaller, or we want to make it bigger. If I want to do that, the very first step is to create the same pointer of type M data, whatever it is. So if that is integer, you do an integer. If it's employee, you do employee. If it's train, you do train. Whatever you have, OK? So you create that one, and you allocate the required amount of memory, the amount of memory you need. In this case, I made it bigger. You could make it smaller. It doesn't make any difference, right? And after doing that, so when you actually allocated a temporary pointer like that, what you do, you copy all the stuff from the old one to the new one. Now, if you shrink it, obviously, you're going to just copy the amount that you can because you're, you're truncating it, right? But in this case, we are just bringing everything because we are enlarging it. We are making it bigger. So you bring all the old stuff to the new stuff, and then you're going to have, you're going to, oops, you're going to have, you're going to have everything copied. When you do that, now you have a copy of all the data you have. Therefore, it's safe to get rid of it. Now you can actually delete the old one. And when you delete it, it will be gone. After that, what you need to do is to actually get the size and update the size to the size that you have. Because now it's set not 7, it's 14, correct? So you update that one, and you, up, uh, you update it. And after updating all the good stuff over there, why do I have two slides over here? Oh, yeah. Up, update it so your size becomes 14 now. OK? Now, your M data is pointing to some junk place that you just deleted, correct? What you need to do is to make m data point where temp is pointing. How do you do that? You get the address inside temp and you put it in m data. As soon as you do that, m data will point to the uh, newly allocated memory and the old address will be gone. All right? Now, hopefully, you have done this all in a function, correct? If you do it in a function, temp will be a local variable inside the function, correct? After the function is over, temp will vanish. 
and all that remains will be M data and the new size. So your program will look like this, which means now you have bigger size of memory. Those are steps of resizing. Okay? All right. Now, <clears throat> classes with resources. What, ha when we have, what does it mean to have classes with resources, people? Anyone? Oh, actually, where was I? I was, I came down to, who was the last person who answered? Uh, so I'll come back to you. Oh, back to you. Yeah. <laughs> so what is a class, class with resources? When we say that some class has resources, what does it mean? Yeah, we only, we only saw it as dynamic memory allocation, but what is the definition for it? What do you think? Mostly. <laughs> I will not forget your name. OK, go ahead. <laughs> I'm not sure. Okay, so I'm an object. I'm a class. I come to the class just like this. This is a class who doesn't have any resources, which means when the class is over, I get out. I have absolutely no problem. Everything's beautiful and done. Now, I have a bottle of water in my hand. Now I'm a class with a resource, which means this is not part of me. I am carrying this with me inside, right? If I just leave and don't take care of that, I have memory leak in the class, which means the water bottle is left over here. I have to make sure before I go, I gather my stuff, put everything, and then go out. That's a class with resource. So classes with resources are classes that they have data outside of their scope, whatever it is. For our case, it happens to be dynamic memory allocation most of the time. But that's not the case. Sometimes you have a port open for communication that you need to close before the thing is gone. Anything that is not within the scope of your class, that we call it classes with resource. Okay? Are we good? If your class represents a file, probably you open it, you want to close it before you go, right? So it means you have unfinished business outside of your territory that you don't have. That's what we call classes with resources. Now, compiler from C language and everything is designed when two objects are assigned to each other, are copied or stuff like that. It simply goes through the scope of one, copies everything blindly onto the other one. Therefore, the bit pattern inside one object will be exactly like the other one. Now, if these two classes have outside resources, they are not copied because only the scope is copied. Therefore, we need to know what will go wrong if such a thing happens. So first, bad assignment. When you have two objects and you, you assign one to another. So I have two objects. As you see, my objects, they have data outside of their scope. The scope of A is this square. The scope of B that I did not write above is this square, correct? If I set one to another, if I actually set B to A, what happens? Compiler is not aware that they are outside sources. It gets everything inside A and copies it into B. Are we good? Therefore, the address inside M data will go to the address inside M data of A, uh, B. The size 7 will override the size 3 of B. And therefore, after this thing is done, B will point exactly to what A is pointing. And what B had becomes memory leak because we didn't take care of it. Right? Are we OK with this? All right. So what happens then? So this is memory leak. Down to this point, life is beautiful. Your program just has memory leak. But let's say in your constructor, because you, in your destructor, because you have dynamic memory allocation, you delete the memory, right? That's what you do. So now what happens is that A goes out of scope. When A goes out of scope, it deletes its memory, correct? Right? And what happens in memory will be B. 
But B is pointing to where? A memory that is already deallocated doesn't belong to us anymore. Now the destructor wants to delete it, and poof, it crashes. Okay? This is usually when your program runs perfectly, but when your program exits, it crashes. Okay? All right? Or when the function ends, it crashes. Everything works perfectly in a function. As soon as the function goes out, all the objects are getting destroyed, that's when it crashes. That's assignment. We have to overwrite that. We have to, if we have classes with resources outside of its scope, we have to tell the compiler, don't do copy, don't do assignment, I'll take care of it. That's number one. This is an easy one. Copying is the messiest. Things that happen behind the scene that we do not even expect. How? This is as, as it happens. So, you have one object, and you want to create a new one out of it. How do you do that? Two ways of doing that. Actually, three ways. Did I? I think I modified it. Did I modify it? Wait, 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 wait. No, I didn't. Did I talk about universal uh, initialization? How do we do initialization in a universal way? Yes. Curly braces, right? I don't know what you said, but somebody said something funny. <laughs> oh. oh, you'll see what it is. I, I'm just updating. Okay, let's let's go back. There you go. So we have a class. We want to make a copy out of it. Okay. This is, these are the three syntaxes that we can use. Assignment at the moment of creation, that's a call to copy constructor. Actual call to copy constructor, that's copying. Or universal way of initialization, that's a copy constructor, right? So I'm essentially copying one class out of another. And C doesn't know that this class has uh, resources outside of its scope. Therefore, it just copies the scope. As soon as it copies the scope, everything gets copied. And as a result, right out of the bat, we have two objects sharing the same piece of memory. And because of this, as soon as one of them is destroyed, the other one's uh, data becomes orphan, and poof, destructor crash. Do we understand this? That's the most obvious one. Number two, we just mentioned how we just mentioned how functions are called. When you have a class and you have a function receiving something by value, when the function is called, the value is assigned to the the, the argument is assigned to the value that is passed, correct? And that's Assignment at the moment of creation, hence, copy constructor. Therefore, the B inside foo will actually be a copy of A outside pointing to its data. When B is over, when foo is over, B dies, takes out with it the data. Now you come back to A and you have nothing. You mainly have nothing. And when that is destroyed, destructor crash. So passing stuff by value will call copy constructor. Another thing. If there is a rule, if I have a line over here drawn on the floor, and I'm not allowed to pass that one, is there any way for me to give this bottle of water to Greg. Oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> I can't. You cannot, I cannot pass that line. You cannot pass that line. Oh. It is impossible for me to give this bottle to him. Do we understand that? Now. It's like a quarantine. Un 
momento, por favor. Okay, so this is so. So let's actually, let's actually do it. So in here, I'm going to say, let's write a function. I'm going to call that function int get int. Okay? And in here, I'm going to say uh, int val. And I'm going to say c in, uh, c out, enter an int. And I'm going to say c in val. And I'm going to say return val. In here, I'm going to say x is equal to get int. And c out, you entered Are we OK with this? Now, please answer to this dilemma of mine. Where is val defined in get int, correct? When get int's call is over, everything inside get int dies, right? So how come the value comes into x? No. That's the scope outside get int. It is impossible. Val is dead. How can I pass the value of something that is dead into x? It's an impossibility. So the compiler comes with a solution. Compiler says, anything you are passing by value, I'm going to create a temporary nameless copy out of it and keep it. Then I'm going to make the function over. Everything in a function dies. I have a nameless, fun a nameless integer at line 23 in the cyberspace. So I copy that one on x using assignment operator. Now that it's done, I destroy the nameless. One more time. Any time an object is returned, an object, primitive, primitive, whatever you call it, anything that is returned by a function, what the compiler does to make it possible for some value to get out of one scope going to another, it creates a temporary nameless copy of that value where the value is returned. So val will go into a temporary nameless integer, gets copied. Then get int is gone, val is destroyed. That temporary nameless object is assigned to x. Sorry, x is assigned to that. X gets the value of temporary nameless. Line 13 is over. The object dies, that temporary nameless. That is copying. So anytime you are returning something by value, again, you are copying it. So the third problem, because of returning object by value, when you have a class returning data class A by value, at the moment of returning, a nameless object is created out of A. That nameless object is a copy constructor. You see that, right? So that's nameless down there. And then it comes down because A is over, A dies. Correct? Foo is over. Foo is over, A dies, takes away the data with it. Now I have a nameless with garbage in it. And it cop tries to copy that garbage to B. And that's when it's going to crash, because it cannot copy it. And then the next one's going to go, and the destructor crash for that one. So you're going to have two crashes over here. Because of these three things, so copy constructor, assignment operator is just for assignment. Done. OK? Copy constructor is for copying, passing by value, returning by value. For these three reasons, you need to overwrite it. So how do we do a good copy or good assignment? So what happens is that you do your copying, 
And when the copying happens, the very first thing you need to do is to measure to see what is the size of the data in A. You allocate value exactly to that so you have the proper value, proper place to copy the data. And all these things are happening in the copy constructor you are writing. So you see what is the size of the thing that is supposed to get copied and you allocate exactly that much. After that, you copy every single bit of information from one to another. Now everything is copied to that one, then you update the size. And voila, you have two classes. One dies, takes the value with it. The second one dies, takes the value with it, and no memory leak. OK? And how do we do good assignment? Good assignment is very similar to good copying. There is only one catch. You are not creating a new object. You already have an object with its own data that you want to assign it to something else. You need to take care of that first. You cannot just allocate. Because the B object over here already exists, you need to first remove that data. So when you are saying B is set to A, first you have to delete the data of the, the target object that is being assigned to something else. After that, everything is exactly like copy constructor. No difference. That's why usually programmers call the assignment operator inside the copy constructor. But they have to make sure that the M data is null before that. That's why always initialize the member variables to null with universal thing. Put a curly bracket in front of everything. It doesn't hurt. Everything's blank. If your data is blank, then the assignment operator will try to delete a null pointer, which does nothing. So you can reuse your code. Always reuse code, your code, especially when you're in a test. Because when I'm asking you to do to rule of three, then writing a copy constraint, an assignment operator is like, Ooh, two seconds, right? In copy constructor, we call assignment operator. Even if you forget or do not implement the assignment operator properly, your copy constructor is perfectly good. Are we okay? Are we okay? One. Are we okay? Two. Sold. So those are the things that we needed to know with dynamic memory allocation. All right, so we did dynamic memory allocation, construction. Construction, we know uh, current object. Everybody knows what current object is, right? Current object. This is a pointer to the current object, target of this. We are okay with uh, 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 pointers notation? Okay, can so somebody read this to me? So this one was, what did I do here? Nothing. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to leave it anyway. I'm going to call it get int. Ah, dot C. By mistake, it's CPP. I'll do it. I'll fix it later. So. I'm going to write you a code snippet so we don't need to know what is at the top. If I have something like this, somebody read this. So you're giving a shot? Good, go ahead. Pointer? Did you say pointer? Target of C. Thank you. Okay, so now how about now? You want to give it a shot? Op 
macro voice. Target of E is target. Oh, big, loud, target of E. Be, <laughs> be proud of it. <laughs> so target of E is set to target of M multiplied by target of C, by tar which means E, M, and C, they are all pointers. Right? So there's a rule with asterisk. Okay? When you look at the asterisk and say, what the heck? That means target of. When the, the asterisk doesn't make sense, that's target of. When the asterisk makes sense, you go, aha, uh -huh, that's multiplication. Okay? When the asterisk comes after a type, it belongs to the type. It means type pointer. Integer pointer, employee pointer, da -da -da pointer. So we have three different types of asterisk. Okay? Are we good? Ampersand is easy. Ampersand is, oh, now in here, actually, in, in, in C was easy. In here, in C, in C++, there's one more thing. So ampersand just by itself, if, if ampersand just stands by itself like an operator is, it's and. But it's a bitwise and. You don't know what it is yet. Okay? We'll learn it at the end of 3, 4, 5. So just and by itself, it's a bitwise and. What it is, we don't care. Two ands together, that's logical and. It means one, true, and true, false and false, stuff like that. Okay? Ampersand comes, you don't, say, you don't know what the heck that means. It means address of. Address of A, address of B, address of C, address of P, address of whatever. Right? If it comes after a type, together it means reference. Okay? So actually, ampersand is much more difficult. Than, <laughs> no. But don't ever say ampersand something. Don't ever say amp asterisk or star A. Never. Always use its name like that. You are teaching yourself subconsciously. Okay? Always n say it properly. If you say star E is star M, star, star C, star, you're not going to get anything. But when you actually name it properly, then you will get it. Okay? Uh, I'm not going to even save this because it doesn't make sense at all. Okay. <laughs> Uh, if you watch the recording. So, uh, member operators. Member. <laughs> member operators. Okay. There shouldn't be anything other than member operators. Member operators are the default of the system. At any moment of any time you want to overload an operator, it has to be a member. Okay? We always, by default, should avoid standalone functions. Standalone functions is that hello at 2 o'clock in the morning that we should always avoid, okay? So, you know what I mean? Did I, I said that in class, right? Okay, I say it in all classes. So, so, so yeah, so, so you never ever have a standalone operator created unless you have to. And there are only two reasons for it. Numero uno, number one, when the left hand operator is not an object, it's not a class. It's a primitive value. It cannot have a member thingy. Like at left-hand operator, you have an integer. You have a double. I'll write you a code for sample. You'll see. Okay? Number two, left side is a class, but you don't have access to it. Like O stream, like I stream, like F stream. Classes that you don't have access to its uh, code. You, don't, you cannot modify it. In these cases, you create helper functions. Friends are good for knife in a back. Always remember that. In object orientation, no friendship. It's a lie. There are no friends. The only thing you have is ownership. Okay? A friend is always an owner. It's not a friend. An ownership needs to be ownership. That's in your workshop six. Text is a friend of line. Because a text owns lines. A line cannot exist without a text, correct? That's your workshop six, right? Yeah. Okay. So remember that. Friends are only between classes. A friend function should never exist. If you want to write a friend function, create an accessor and use it instead. Let's give you an example for all these. So, say I have a class. Give me a simple class to, to, to write. Student. student. I wrote student in all classes. I'm writing student again over here. Student it is. <clears throat> student. So, class student. 
Okay? Character, uh, pointer name. It has a dynamic name, so it has classes with resource, correct? Are, are we okay? Yeah. All right. And I made a mistake. It's M name, not name. And then I have integer actually unsigned integer um, student number. And I, I don't need to write int when you just write unsigned. That's unsigned it anyway. And then I have a double GPA. Are we okay with this? So the very first thing you do when you do this, right? Safe empty state. Make sure everything is set to its defaults so you don't have to do it in every individual constructor. You do it like that, you don't need to worry about anything. They're all set anyway. Okay? Now, uh, I need a default constructor for this? Sure. Okay, so I'm going to write over here public. Student, student, yes, default constructor. Let's say I want to create a student with a constant character pointer name. And let's say a student ID, so unsigned student number. And maybe I want to create a student number student only with a student number. Although you can leave these empty. Never, ever do that, ever. Use that opportunity to give yourself meaningful comment. If you write student constant character pointer unsigned, you don't know what the heck they are, right? Okay, I see lots of my colleagues do that. I believe that's lack of experience in real life programming. Because if you do something like that, the next person who wants to come maintain your code has no idea what the heck is that. They have to go trace your code to find out what the heck is going on. Why? Okay, and not only that, I suggest when you are creating prototypes, actually name is fine, but in here, right student number you don't need to write that when you're actually writing your code but when you are writing it over there it is a comment that tells people that is being passed so it's a good practice okay that's that so say uh what else i wanted to well i wanted to talk about why did i even write this <laughs> um Give me a second. I'm going to go with operators. So, so let's say I want to add to the GPA of a student. If I want to add to the GPA of a student, that's quite simple. I'm going to create an operator plus equal that adds to the GPA, correct? And then I want to actually, what do I want to do? And I want to add some double value to it, correct? And I'll, although I can make this one void, but never do. When you don't need to return anything, always return reference of the current object. It becomes handy one day. Okay? Next. <clears throat> if I want to, for example, in a program, I want to accumulate the GPA of all the students and find what is the GPA of the class. So I need to have a double number plus the GPA of a student. That operator cannot be a member. That is when I have a helper. For that helper, what I do is this. I create over here. So in here, I'm going to say double operate, operator plus. At left side, I have a double value or GPA. And at right side, I have a constant student reference S. Now, in here, I need to do the GPA thingy and return it, right? Right? I want to get the GPA of the student and put it there. For some reason, 
I see this code happening. That's wrong. You should never do that. You should never key, get the, give the key of your class to some stranger over here that can do stuff with your class that you don't want to. This class doesn't need to have access to the name of the student. What the heck was the name of a student for? Yes. Not avoid. Like you do that, it's criminal. You shouldn't do that. You just committed murder. Don't do that. OK? <laughs> for that, I mean, like, this is wrong. A function should never, if you want to make it a friend, instead do this. Create uh, an organized, secure thing to access the GPA only. So in here, I'm going to create something like this. I'm going to say double GPA, and I make it constant, and I return GPA. So this, if anybody wants to get the GPA, that's, the, that's what they do. They cannot access anything else. Now this doesn't need a friend. All I need to do over here is to say return GPA plus equal s dot GPA, and done. No friendship needed. Mission accomplished. You follow? So you do not create friends. So that's one way. That was a very big sigh of thing. Is it? Everything's okay. You're good. <sighs> Are we good? Well, I'm reviewing. You're, you, this is half, first half of the semester. You need to you, you, you know these things, right? And if you want to, or that that's one case that you want to have something that is not a member. And by the way, because all these like if you know that because I have different constructors, you have to implement the default constructor, correct? And what default constructor is supposed to do? Set everything to null, correct? But it's already null, so I don't need to write it. How can I not write it? Equal default. So you can actually do this. You can actually say, hey, compiler, I know that I have to write it, but please do do it. I'm lazy. It creates an empty. So this creates an empty. This creates an empty uh, default constructor. Ah, OK, constructor. Obviously, you're going to have copy constructor assignment and all the good stuff. I'm not going to write those things because this, you know, um, that's not what I'm covering. I'm doing operator overload. So the next operator overload over here would be, for example, to print this on C out. To do that, there is a standard way of doing it in my class and later on in the semester in, in whatever you are doing. Follow this standard all the time. First, create a function that prints, writes, outputs the way you want it. And the signature of that should be as follows. OStream reference, up, uh, uh, say write or print or whatever you are calling it. It doesn't matter. OStream reference OSDR, set it by default to std c out so they can just call the right and it's going to print it on c out are we good okay and what do you do with that you print whatever you have like you say always so if name so if this is if the object is valid that's safe empty state now you're going to say ostr say name name And uh, student number, or yeah, student number, and probably in parentheses you want to print, say, GPA. Now, obviously, you're going to format it to a nice way and whatever. And that's M name, not name. So I print it, and then I return OSDR. OK? So that function is functional. People actually can write it if I put a semicolon here. So they can actually have a student, student, and they can print the student. They can, oh, student S. They can actually print, they can go, they can go S, 
dot write. Correct? And that is going to print it on C out. Are we okay with this? Are we okay with this? The good thing about this is that because you created this default thingy, it can work for O stream and all its children. Okay? Because O stream has lots of children, right? Namely, OF stream. So, for example, if you have something like this over here, something like If you have something like this over here, say f stream, oh, of stream, file student txt, for example, something like that, you can actually say s.write into file. Because file is child of o stream, it knows how to write it. It knows from its parent. You're going to learn how to implement it later. That's the best way of polymorphism. Best action, best polymorphism thing, that, best implementation of polymorphism. Right is right, correct? You're both saying right. In one of them, you say file. In the other one, you say nothing. Automatically, it knows which right to call. How? Magic. We'll learn later on. Okay? Probably the next day you're coming in. Okay? So, that's that one. Now, if I want this thing to work with C out, how do I do that? That's three seconds. You should be able to do this with your eyes closed. Okay? Every operator that you are, if it's I stream, you put I stream. This is O stream. Operator, insertion, is it? It's called insertion, right? Insertion operator at left, uh, at O stream, reference OSDR, and at right soft constant. Oh, 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 oh I, I committed a, a crime against humanity. Constant. It has to be constant. Constant student reference s. If it's read, you don't need to. You don't, you don't do constant. Now in here, all you need to do is to say return s dot write, and you pass OSDR to it. Now doing so, you can either say c out s and l, or you can say File, S, and L. They will work perfectly. Why C out is file's mother? Because of that, file knows how to deal with C out. They all work. Magic. Okay? You learn how to implement this magic later on. Um, I could, would it work now? Let's see if I compile it. I don't know if I, if, if, oh, I haven't implemented anything in here. I didn't implement those things. Actually, as a practice, implement this, this, and this, and test it. See if it works or not, okay? 243, oh my goodness. Sorry, I didn't give you a break. Let's go 15 minutes more and, and what happened? What did I do? What you talking about? You're talking about this to be outside? Yeah. I just, I was lazy. I wrote inline. It works. It doesn't make any difference. If you want to make it a module, yes. Put it outside. Put the class in a header file. Put it in. What are you talking about? I'm <laughs> I have no idea what he says. Put what where? What do I do? Let me see what I have to cover. If I have, if I have nothing else, I'll fully implement it. How about that? Uh, not now, next time. So people can listen to this recording and know that I'm going to take a dentist next time. Yeah. I'm going to pr probably bring another computer and ask you just swipe your card in it. I don't think I need to cover anything else. We talked about everything, input, output, her everything's covered. So you want me to fully uh, implement this uh, student thingy? 
What are you talking about? Something. I, I don't like that. That, that, means you, that means you had a question. Now you want to go home, drink some beer. You don't want to listen to this. <laughs> Anybody wants me to fully implement this so it works? Nope. Okay. All right. So please, you know what? Fully implement it so it works. Copy, constructor, everything. Rule of three. Then uh, do a pull request. What is a pull request? Clone my repository modify it, then submit it, then do a pull request. I merge your code and put your code over here. So your name is going to come at the top of the thing. You did this. Whoever does it earlier, so I'm going to do a pull request. Uh, you can do a pull request, and I merge it into my code. And it's a good practice, OK? And just, just to make sure that you are doing it right, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to write over here this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to say. Uh, void write, and in here I'm going to say student s, and in here I'm going to say s file oh, oh, ah! file s and l. Not uh, and in here I'm going to say uh, of stream reference file. So just to see if you're uh, you actually impl implemented the rule of three properly. And in here I'm going to say write uh, s into file. If you did not implement it properly, it will crash because it has to copy student and the student's going to die and yada, yada, yada. So that uh, makes sure that you have implemented things properly. All right? Uh, questions? Yes. I know, I know. I haven't done it. I told you. Give me a, the, ah, give me, let me. No, no, I have to set everything. Your due date's going to be Monday oh. or Tuesday, something like that. I'm going to update it. So the due date's going to be end of Monday for all apps from now on. But I, but I have to set things up first. Okay, so. I thought it was on the due date. No, no, everything. I don't have my schedule on, on the thing. I don't have, I'm just trying to figure out uh, how to work with Blackboard. So. <laughs> so you'll see. Uh, it's going to be set. So give me this week to put things in order, and everything's going to be organized the next week. So. Uh, you finish it. Yeah. But submission is going to be next week, Monday or something. OK, don't worry about it. We're good? Oh, it, it's in that it's in that workshop zero. The part that says Mac, take yeah. so. Right. so the oh, you installed Windows? Yeah. Oh, you did you Fusion? Yeah, I. Oh, it. okay, sure, sure, sure. Windows, but I don't know how to use it. Oh, yeah, because it, now that's a blank computer now. It, you have to install Windows on it. Oh, it's, a blank, it's a blank computer. You have to put a USB key with Windows in it and, and install Windows on it. That's like a blank computer now. Oh, okay. You so got it, what I'm saying? You have software inside. No, no. You, by creating Fusion, you created an empty computer. There's nothing in it. You can install it. But, and, and as I see, you did it as Windows. So just put a uh, uh, download. Or if you don't have it, I can bring the key for you. Just put it in a USB and install it from there. Or you can do everything manual on Mac. You don't have to do it that way. Command line. Oh, that's a little bit Bootcamp. Huh? It supports bootcamp, so you can use it. Boot, bootcamp is awful. It ha makes, splits your computer in half. It's easier. Yeah, I don't think so. I think they, this, the, the Fusion is easier. Yeah. The, the, prob the problem with boot camp is that it splits your heart in half. You lose half of your heart. You don't need more than like 100. So yeah. I'll try that. I know. How much, how much uh, hard drive you have? What is, yeah, the capa capa what is the capacity of your hard drive on this computer? Uh, 256. Oh, no, 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 don't, don't, don't. No, no. no. 
five, even that's not enough. So, so the good thing about fusion is that you shut it down, everything's back. You, you can have both at the same time. This one is either Mac or. So, no, no, the fusion is fine. Either fusion or uh, fusion VMware, the same thing. Fusion is VMware. Through command line, yeah, you can do all those. Everything I have it in the, um, I have it in the, and oh, I, and we are recording all this. Let me stop recording first. <laughs> Let me stop recording.